Tonight we're going to talk about uh, generational spirits. The conferences are going to be broken over the next two days into essentially four parts. The first is um, what generational spirits there are, what kind, um, how, and the various ways in which they work, how they get in, how they continue to stay, uh, etc. The next one, is, then the next conference is going to be on uh, how to identify them in your own family. Because 99% uh, of families have one. In fact, I've never really met a family that didn't have one. So, or at least one. Sometimes it depends on the, the different lines. The third is, then the third conference is going to be on uh, how to get them out, specifically. The fourth then is gonna be talking about how it's possible for one individual to be under more than one set of generational spirits um, and how you can uh, deal with that. But then that's also where I'm probably going to talk. Some of you probably already heard the conference where I talk about the six, six generational spirits over the last six generations. I'm going to talk a little bit about those, add a little bit more than you might have heard in the conference, um, and to start that. The term generational spirit actually has two different meanings. Probably some of you in the back may not be able to see this. Generational can either mean uh, there's a general sense in which this is taken and that means it's any spirit that's passed from one person to another in any way okay the demons aren't contagious it's not like you sneeze and then the other person has it we're going to actually talk about the precise mechanisms that cause this passing because people have to understand how it works but this is just a general sense of or a general term to cover any way in which a demon is passed from one person to another. So it can actually be um, your, your brother can pass it to you and things of this sort. That's what we're actually talking about. The next one is that's which is particular through the family line to the specific lineage. And this is when you hear people talk about generational spirits, they usually talk about family spirits. That is, as they're passed within a generational line from one generation to another in the same family. Okay. So this is, this is the kind of general complexus about this, but we want to talk about the different kinds of generational spirits. In the past, they used to talk about what they called a familial. A familial spirit is something that seems to be around an individual. They're just hanging around them all the time. Now, this familial spirit can either be generational in the sense that a child is past this, uh, when they're very young, um, actually uh, from the time of conception, they can be past this familial spirit that's in the family, which is actually the familial, oh, sorry, uh, familiar, the familiar spirit, which is the one in the family. But you can also have a familial spirit in which somebody does something, and as a result of that, this per the spirit attaches themselves to the individual because of what they've done. That familial spirit can become familiar in the sense of that if the person has a particular headship, we'll talk about this in a minute, if they have a headship in the family, they can end up passing that spirit on or just, again, we'll talk about the mechanisms, then it can get into a familial, uh, familiar line and then get passed. So those are, that's one way. So the, the primary generational spirit to talk about is the familiar, that's the one in the family, okay? But there are other kind of generational spirits. And how do we break them down? It's very simple. Generational spirits, when you're talking about in the general sense, are the same as the guardian spirits that, are that God assigns. The categories are essentially the same. So you can have a generational spirit as a family is uh, properly constituted within a valid marriage. God assigns an a guardian angel to that particular family. But very often, then Satan will assign a, a demon to it in order to tempt it, and the goal of that demon is to get it, its foot in the door so that it becomes permanently attached to the line. But it's also, uh, he may do something else to get a different spirit in, because demons are all in a hierarchy, and so the one above will say, get me into this family. <coughs> So then he sends the little minion out, and the minion tempts him in a manner that will open the door to this other particular kind of spirit. Okay. So the um, so one is over the family. The next can actually be generational. By this I mean in the sense of 
if you're part of the of the what they used to call the hippie generation, there's a very specific spirit. We'll talk about that in the fourth conference. There's a very specific spirit that affects that family. So it can be over the whole generation, worldwide. We're not talking about just here, but one that's assigned to the whole generation worldwide. The next one can be over um, particular countries. This is something that we actually saw. So, for example, they often talk about how there is possession of countries, which happened in um, some exorcist surmise that there was a particular spirit in Nazi Germany when there was a particular spirit which basically put people under a particular uh, affected them intellectually so that they easily came under the sway of what ended up happening to them. Okay, So they can be over countries. It can also be over races. Now this isn't a bigoted statement. This is an observation of fact. It doesn't say a thing about the particular race, by the way, because every single race has one. For example, if you look at the, um, the Native American Indians, very often, not all of them, but very often they're actually beset by a specific spirit that was proper to, was passed on within the native spirituality. So when you get, when people will come in into the exorcist and he's doing an intake, one of the first things you'll talk about is their family, family background and you'll find out that they, that they are Native American and then you have to, because sometimes it's generational in relationship to the fact that the, the person is having particular problems in the family and it's connected to this particular thing, okay, to this particular spirit. Another one that we've seen is in relationship to Hispanics. Doesn't say a thing about any Hispanic, because sometimes generational spirits actually skip a generation, not just within the particular race, but also within the family in general. You'll see this. So in a family, you'll have, uh, everybody seems to be affected by this particular generational spirit. I'm going to talk a little bit about a few that I've seen that are very marked when we talk about the mechanism. But it can skip a particular individual in a generation. So you can have somebody in the whole family who's just a mess, but one person seems to be totally normal, right? So, and you, you'll see that. But sometimes, too, the generational spirit is the inverse of that. So the, the whole family's normal, but then one of the kids just goes completely off the rails, and once you start dealing with it, you find out that it's because of some generational thing in the past. So in the relationship with Hispanics, if there's a connection to any type of Aztec or Mayan family lineage in the sense of if there was something in which the uh, the particular spirituality was kept alive within that lineage, even if it stops and the people become Catholic, that spirit can sometimes uh, continue on. Okay. And usually each one has its own complexus. Right? There's, no, there's a certain complexion that it has. Okay. So what are the mechanisms by which this actually gets passed? Oh, sorry, we've got to talk. So it can be over generations. The family, it can be over nations, races, it can actually, you can actually end up in a situation where it can even be in corporations, where a demon gets his foot in the door and the corporation ends up dysfunctional and it maintains that dysfunction all the way until it collapses. It can actually be in regions, you can have generational spirits in regions, um, for example, the, um, uh, the two that are the most obvious that have been there for a little while. In Fresno, California, it's a demon of illness that's there. In uh, Los Angeles, this won't be a surprise, it's the demon of unreality, disconnected from reality. Okay, so there can be very specific places, and it's uh, demons are in particular, particular places. In the south, there is a demon connected to, um, uh, as you, you'll actually see this in the Alabama area, and that whole area, actually, um, from Alabama, Georgia, that whole section, there's actually a, uh, a particular demon that got in there that is the result of when they slaughtered the, um, the Native Americans and the uh, Europeans, when they came over, slaughtered each other. There's a specific area that now this demon has been in there for quite some time, and he's been there for uh, like a hundred and some years. He's been sitting in here causing problems. And as a result, what you'll actually see is because demons like, they, they're like God, God likes to make us into little images of himself. 
And so the demons like to do the same thing. They like to make us into that. And so people who live in that area will start to take on a certain kind of mindset and, a, and even personality traits that are particular in that area. It's not just genes. Even in the familiar line, people say, oh, well, that's just genes, right? No, sorry, the alcoholism isn't in this particular case isn't a gene. We'll see. We'll talk about that. It can be, but it's not necessary. Okay. So it can be over regions, etc. Um, you can also get it in dioceses where a particular diocese is afflicted by a particular thing. It can be in religious orders, where a particular demon gets passed on from one generation to another within the religious order. That there's a very specific kind of spirit that you see that's just dysfunctional and it just goes on forever and it doesn't seem to ever get really kind of cured. Um, so it can be in any one of these. Um, and so you just have to be aware of the fact that sometimes it just gets passed. How does it get passed? There's essentially three ways in which a generational spirit gets passed. The first, or sorry, first we've got to talk about how he gets in. Then we'll talk about how he gets passed. So the first way he gets in is always through some kind of sin. And we're not talking about venial sin here. We're talking about something grave, some mortal sin. The person, somebody in a family line commits a mortal sin. That mortal sin then gets into the uh the family so the primary way that which he gets in is by committing the sin attaching himself to somebody in the lineage then from there it gets passed we'll talk about how that happens in a minute okay the next is from some kind of a curse people will be cursed within a particular family and it gets passed from generation to generation sometimes these coincide so for example if you take the freemasonic curse they coincide the Freemasonic curse has a very distinctive, when the spirits get in from Freemasonry, they have a very distinctive patterns that you will see. There's certain kind of health patterns, usually things revolving around uh, respiration, things of that sort. They'll also, in, with the Freemasonic spirit that gets passed generationally, there is, uh, and I'm, I'm not passing any judgment on anybody who's become a Freemason, well, maybe. Okay. <laughs> but... What happens is, is one of the principal things that ends up happening in a relationship to Freemasons is because of the nature of the sin that gets them in and the curse that they agree to take on to their family line to the fourth and fifth generations, very often um, sins against the sixth commandment, specifically molestation, gets passed from generation to generation. I've actually seen, used in, 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 uh, when women come to me and I ask, they, they tell me they've been molested and there's something diabolic that's about it, over 50% of the time, there's Freemasonry involved in some way. So this is when people sit there and say, oh, it's just a group of nice guys. Sorry, it is a thoroughly evil institution. I'm not saying that the people at the bottom understand that, but it's a thoroughly evil institution. And the way you know that, too, is especially when you get to the top, it's completely Luciferian. Okay. So the Freemason, the other thing is, too, is alcohol abuse. Uh, things of this sort get passed from generation in relationship to the Freemasonic spirit. And that's because of the curse that's actually taken on. But sometimes somebody be, can, can be cursed. So I've seen cases where um, fertility issues among women get passed from generation to generation. It's connected to some curse that's very often two or three generations back. So this is one of the ways in which it can actually get in. So the sin of the individual, then the person, someone in the particular line is cursed. By the way, it doesn't mean that the person has to have an open door necessarily in relationship to it. By the way, this curse can occur on somebody as early as the time in which they're in the womb. So one of the things that happened in Italy is they discovered that a number of kids were becoming possessed. And so they sent a team from the Vatican up. You might have heard this story. They sent a team to the Vatican up. And what they discovered is, is that um, they, the, the, the reason why the children were being possessed and wasn't being broken is because they were skipping the exorcisms in the old right because they, they didn't believe the children could be possessed. But before that, then, uh, before that, they uh, began to realize that, that a large percentage of those or a certain amount of them were the result of one woman would have a spat with another woman and so the other woman would curse the child and the other woman's womb and then that's how they would, the kid would become subject to the possession. Okay, so the moral of the story is make sure you get, get baptized and make sure the priest does the exorcisms. Okay, the, um, then, so sin, the curse, 
God can permit a spirit to afflict a generational line for a specific reason, but it's very, uh, actually technically all of them can only stay around for as long as he, as he permits. The normal duration for generational spirit in a family is five generations, four to five. Usually at the end of that, things start to kind of pan out, something happens and the spirit seems to lose its, uh, its ability to influence. Or God sends somebody into the generational, or into the person's, uh, one of the people's, in the generational line's life, and then from there the person gets cleaned up, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. So the, the demon gets attached to a particular individual within the generational line. Then it gets passed, and it gets passed in again three ways. If God permits it, that's the primary way. But then uh, the second way is actually through subsequent sin. So once the demon attaches himself to say, <coughs> um, the uh, say to one of the one of the kids in the family, then or even one of the parents, once it gets in, then it's in the helm because it's attached to the individual. And so he brings it with him anytime he comes home. And once he's in the home, then he sits and picks at the other people in the home because of the nature of authority, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But he gets into the home and he starts picking at the other people to commit certain sins so that he can get his foot in the door and get past. This mechanism of passing the generational spirit is actually understood very clearly by the Satanists. There are Satanists, even in this country, who have passed the same demon through possession from one child, from them, to their children, to their children, to their children, for over 400 years. So, it's, and what they do is, they specifically have the child, and as soon as the kid is in the womb, they're already doing everything to get the kid possessed. And by the time it's out, the rituals are done, the thing is consecrated, etc., and it ends up possessed. And that's the goal. And the reason being, why? <clears throat> it's because the demon wants to stick around. He doesn't want to have to go back to hell and, and face the music. All right. Or lack thereof. Okay. So the person commits a sin. So the, one of the principal ways is, is that the demon commits the sin. Or sorry, the person commits the sin. And then they get in. Then it picks on the other people in the family to commit the sin. And then from there it gets passed from generation to generation. We'll see how this differs on how you're actually supposed to deal with them, how you're supposed to get them out. How they got in and how they're being passed will determine how you're going to get them out to some degree. The next is purely by authority. Now, some of you might have heard me talk about this. Authority is a real thing. It's a real structure. It's, what, what authority actually is, is it's a structure that God put in our minds, it's part of the natural law, to grasp that a person has rights to command us to do a specific thing. So when I'm under the authority of someone else, <coughs> intellectually I grasp this command of his has a specific force. Now emotionally or psychologically, I can choose to follow it or not, but intellectually I still see it as part of the natural law to grasp this. It's true even in demons. Even they have this built into their structure, into their intellect. So when you command them to do something, if the command is done on behalf of the church, on behalf of God, what have you, they know they have to comply. Okay. So it's the same thing here. So what happens is in relationship to the authority and it passing on generationally, and I'm going to talk about a particular case here, there is it, what happens is, is, is usually it starts with the father, about 80% of the time, sometimes with the mother. But somebody in authority commits the sin. The demon gets attached to that person, and then if the person's complicit in the uh, activity that the demon is trying to encourage them to do, then what happens is, is when they have the child, because once you let the child, when, if you're in a position of authority, it's just like bad friends. Let's just back up a little bit. If a man decides that he wants to bring a friend home, right? Once the guy's in the home, he's good. There's certain things he's just going to do, right? And so you know, if you're bringing him home, you got to make sure he's the guy that's going to act and behave properly, right? Well, in the case of demons, when you come home, it's being the friend home. He's in your house, which means he's going to just start doing stuff, right? Okay. But that means that you are, by bringing him into the home, by committing the sin, you see this really a lot with pornography, when guys watch pornography, 
we'll talk about that a little bit in, in just a little bit. But they'll perform the action that does that. But because he's the head of the household and he brings the thing into the house, that means everyone else becomes subject to him indirectly at least. And this is one of the reasons why it becomes a problem. Now, once the person has been complicit in this, and once he's brought the demon home and he becomes complicit in it, then what happens is, is anybody under him becomes subject also to that demon when he becomes, when he lets him into the home. Then what happens is, is each time, each with each subsequent generation, it can be passed purely on the authority structure, from father to daughter, from daughter to child, etc. So, for example, some of you heard me talk about this. There was a, a woman who brought me her child. She, the child was 10 months old, little girl, cute little thing. And um, it was the, one of the most beautiful little placid kids you'd met until the demon manifested. And then my nickname for it became Chucky the Doll. Literally, you couldn't hold the thing because it would try and gouge your eyes out. It's only 10 months old. It can't even hardly move. I mean, it has no control of its motor function hardly. And yet it's trying to gouge your eyes out. Okay. What we discovered, we think, through that process was is that through the father, who was an upstart, he was a he was a moral, a very good moral man. Actually, I think he was <clears throat> rather saintly, but we think it was passed to him, and then from him to the daughter, and then it skipped the daughter in the generations, but then it did end up in her daughter as a result of this. This authority structure is through the biological lineage line. So people who adopt children, very often they're adopting a child who that this the generational spirits have been passed on to that child. So sometimes people will bring the kids that, they, that they've adopted, um, and the kid is just all over the place, right? Now sometimes it's because they're they're for the first year or so, or a few months or so, their needs aren't being taken care of. But sometimes, which by the way is itself an open door, we'll see that here in a minute. Um, but the uh, but the actual, if the parents have done something, it can pass to the child and the child on. Again, sometimes it can skip. Sometimes God can block it. This is the this, by the way, this is the reason why the church actually has exorcisms and baptism. It's not just because they think it's a nice idea to you know to exorcise children. It's for this very specific reason. We actually saw it in Scripture. If you look at the um, if you look at uh, the scripture with the time where Christ, the father comes to Christ and says, would you please help my son? His son is tearing his flesh and doing the whole bit. And Christ asks him, how long has he been this way? And he says, from birth. Now, that tells us one of two things. Either the child was cursed in utero, or we're talking about a generational spirit in that process. And so then Christ casts the demon out, and then the, 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 the kid is normal. He's a young adult by this stage. Okay. So but the point is, is that it's passed on through this authority line. Just having a child is the process of that authority. Why? Because children have built into them a natural inclination that they know they have to obey their parents. Even when they're not obeying, they know, you can say, you know you're not supposed to be doing that. Right? Even, when he's, even when he doesn't have full use of his, of, um, his uh, conscience yet, a reason, you can see it. They're going in there watching to see if you're going to get them, right? They know. There's a natural inclination to know they must submit to their parents. And you see this. Kids just naturally submit. Okay. That means that that passing on of that authority line is built into the very natural law. So just in the process of having a child, this authority structure thing kicks in. And this is why it can be in adoptive children, but it can be in your own children. And it can pass from generation to generation. In every family, obviously, there's the mother and the father. So you can actually end up with two, <laughs> two sets of generational baggage, so to speak. But my experience is, is that usually in the past of the lineage, it's the one that's the more predominant that gets passed. So for example, if in the mother's line there's a problem of fear going back a couple of generations, a demon of fear, 
and the fathers is just a spirit of laziness. And the father still kind of works from time to time. He's not really lazy, but once in a while he just like laying around doing nothing. But usually, the, whereas the mother really struggles with fear, that's going to get passed on to the children, normally speaking. So it's the one that tends to be more predominant. How far you go back, you know, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you have to take the time to sit, sit down and figure it out. So when, when I start to see this pattern, this generational spirit being passed, and as I mentioned, you know, sometimes like the Freemasonry or other kinds of spirits, it's like spirits of fear. Spirits of fear are very often passed in generational lines. And so when people are really struggling with fear, I ask, how are your parents doing with this? Oh, my mom, she suffers the same thing. What about her parents? Oh, well, her dad really had this issue. Or sometimes, and this is something that is quite important. Uh, we'll talk about that. I just want to mention one of the things, the relationship to the curse. There can also be, there's a technical term called malifies. It literally comes from the Latin, two Latin words, malus facere. It means to, to do something evil. If somebody does something evil against somebody, that can introduce a demon into the generational line. So, and then demons do this oppression thing, which we'll talk about how do they work, right? Talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so back to the mother and the father. So in relationship to this, so if somebody does something bad against you or if you do something sinful yourself, this can still get passed on. Even though you didn't do anything, it can still get passed. Probably think to yourself, oh man, we're all just a mess here. Okay. <laughs> so going back to this in relationship to the generational line, a lot of times demons obfuscate. Obfuscate. I'll write the word. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be like Mr. Uh, Robinson. Today's word is... Okay. <laughs> Having written three books on psychology, I did come up with a theory as to why when you get to a, uh, uh, get to a blackboard, you can't write. Okay. <laughs> word obfuscate. It basically means that you, you use this tactic where you get this diversional type of thing or you try and cloud the situation so that the person doesn't know what's going on. So for example, most, there are demons of impurity, but I rarely see them true demons of impurity. They're there, Leviathan, Asmodeus, Baal, you know, the whole shebang, Beelzebub. They're demons of impurity, but you don't see those guys too often. What you tend to do is you tend to see some other kind of a spirit that drives that problem. So the demon of fear will often drive demons uh, problems against chastity so that the person wastes all their time on that issue and they don't get to their real issue, which is fear. Okay. The same thing will actually happen in a generational line. So you can actually, I know one family whose generational line, the problem was fear. The way you saw it manifest itself was lack of chastity. Okay. And another generational um, spirit, which was very clear, was in this woman who was possessed. It was her great-great-grandfather who had introduced a demon of pride into the generational line. The way that pride manifests itself was, yeah, they were proud. And so like this other friend, yeah, everybody suffered from fear, but it was usually low grade. It's not that pronounced. But in this other generational line that had pride, it manifested itself in intemperance. So the demon would actually drive things like alcoholism, drug abuse, problems with chastity, but not so much. Um, you know, other things along that particular line. So this is going to become really important when we talk about how you discern what this guy is in your family lineage. Because, as you've heard me say, in spiritual warfare, precision is everything. You can pray until the cows come home and you're not going to get him out of your lineage until you know exactly what his angle is, that is his nature. Then once you do that, then there's ways of getting him out. So they're going to obfuscate. So that's what they'll do through this generational line. So a lot of times what you see in a particular family isn't really their problem. Now this brings up a very, very important point. One of the biggest mistakes we tend to make, oh, and by the way, remind me, I gotta talk about spirits that are in movements. Okay. They get passed on generation. 
but I just lost my other thought. Here, I'm trying to keep this thought, and I just lost my other thought. Precision is everything. So what will happen is, as I mentioned, people will pray and pray and pray, and they never get this thing actually driven out because they don't really know what is this particular spirit. And they'll actually spend a lot of time actually doing it. Okay. Still lost my thought. You said what you see is not the problem. Oh, yes. Okay. So what you see isn't necessarily the problem in a particular family. This brings up a very important point. A lot of times, we will look at somebody or some family and say, man, that family's a mess. Or, you know, that, that husband in that family is a real jerk. Or, you know, he's really abusive of so-and-so or of, of his wife, or you'll see the kids are just, you know, a mess. There can be, if you're not careful, there can be a tendency to judge them as these people just aren't coming up to speed. The generational spirits are all in a hierarchy. Some families have bigger dudes than others. And that means that families, even when they're leading good Catholic lives, can be ravaged by these things and we don't know what baggage they're carrying. This is something that's very important for us as human beings. One of the first things I discovered as an exorcist, and I'm dealing with people, you know, and seeing some of their behaviors as a reason that they've recounted to me once they, you know, once this even got in their life, and then these particular things happen, I began to realize, you know, you, we, we aren't in a position to judge anybody because we don't know what baggage they're carrying. Okay, it's the same thing in relationship to families and generational spirits. We don't know, so be very careful. The best thing to do is to pray for them. Uh, we'll talk about how you can actually pray for other people so that they discover that this guy's in their baggage. Okay. Movements. There can be demons even in movements. We're saying this a little bit, I think, in relationship to, um, uh, not to get too political here, but if you look at the Democratic Party and its movement, it's fraught with hypocrisy and fraud. Right? It's just part of the matrix, right? How it got in there? I don't know. I don't really care. But the point is, is that it's there. But another movement that you're seeing that's in there is the traditional movement. It's got its own demon. And its own demon is a spirit of, of, of um, criticism. Why did it get in? Because most people who hold to the traditional Catholic faith have fought immensely to keep them and their children on the right path towards that. That meant that a lot of times they had to sit in the pew and listen to the priest say stuff that was completely contrary to the faith or said stuff that was just wacky. And so they're trying to sort this stuff out, at least initially, and once they started coming, but then it was over the course of time they gave in to the spirit of criticizing the priest. So they become very critical of other people and they become, they start looking down on them. So it's a subtle spirit of pride, but it's a spirit of criticism. Then what ends up happening is, <clears throat> is so then they get to a place where they actually have a full-blown tradition but they still have this spirit attached to them and so they start criticizing everybody and every even the priest who's actually doing an admirable job okay so they can actually be in movements you have to be very careful back to the family side of it so i tell people look <clears throat> when you're considering courtship <laughs> You may want to do a little bit of a sermon of spirits here and find out what baggage this girl's going to be bringing to the equation and what he's going to be bringing to the equation, right? So if you see on their side that the family is a complete disaster, I'm not saying that you should say, sorry, dear, you just, your family's a disaster, which means you're probably going to be a disaster. No, uh, it just means that you're going to have to be aware of the stuff that you're actually going to be bringing to your family. And this is actually true. I mean, just recently in, in uh, marriages that I've seen is generational spirits have been passed. And so it's in the marriage already playing around. And the demons are going to be working on the marriage in order to affect that. Okay. So this is, okay, so the mechanism they get in is through either through sin. And then once it gets in, so it can be passed from sin. And then it can be also passed through authority. How do we know this through authority? Exorcists have observed, and some priests themselves will notice the phenomenon, but they don't know quite what to make of it. And it's this. You're sitting in the confessional. 
the Father comes in and confesses a very distinctive kind of sin against the Sixth Commandment. So, you give him the penance. Then, his young child comes in, six to nine years of age, and starts confessing that they're having thoughts that are identical to what the Father has been engaging in, and nobody even knows about it outside the Father and the priest. So you can see the demon's already got his foot in the family through this guy and it's starting to pick on the children. Okay. So this is one of the ways that you actually notice it, that it's getting past. So there has been times where I've had to tell people, look, you knock it off. Your kids are going to end up with this problem, right? Usually it doesn't matter anyway to people. Because people don't want to do the battle that's necessary in order to get them out. Okay. The spirits then cause once they get in even through authority their goal is to commit get the people to commit the sin and why is that is in order to increase their hold on the particular family they will also start picking at each other and they will use the specific nature of the demon in order to achieve that so for example one family i knew who had a very distinctive demon of fear was kind of a generalized fear it wasn't anything specific it was just a generalized fear if you saw the family, you would think that their problem was quarreling because they just fought all the time. Even the kids, although the kids still loved each other, they loved beating up on each other, making each other, you know, fighting. Okay. So why was, the, why was the quarreling the result of the demon of fear? Because they didn't want to suffer. They were afraid of suffering. And so when people, when one of the people in the family would say something, they didn't want to suffer that, and so they would start fighting and bickering about it because they didn't want to have to suffer the process. And so you'll see this where they start working other angles. The goal is to get more than one generational spirit in the lineage. It's one of the things. Demons are like flies. Once you got one, give it time, you'll have others congregating around unless you get rid of that fly, right? Or unless you get rid of the thing that's attracting the fly, which is usually what the real issue is in the family. Okay, But the point being is, is, so why does God allow these things in our generational line? It's very simple. Sometimes it's a, more, it's a matter of punishing people in the line, but not too often. Just as God allows any demon in a particular, in a particular person's life, sometimes, as St. Alphonsus Liguri says, it's to punish the individual uh, to chastise them for the evil that they're doing. Okay. But usually it's in order so that <coughs> through the struggle of that particular demon that the people will achieve a certain level of virtue against it. And so his desire isn't just that each individual has a particular set of virtues. So he'll let a demon in a particular individual's life so that the person grows in virtue against that and conquers the demon, humiliates the demon, etc. But the other side of it is is that the, uh, he actually likes fashioning the whole family. If you look at the complexion of the nine hierarchies of angels and the specific things that God assigned them to, one angel actually has a certain kind of an affinity or friendship with the other angel, not based just on the fact that they both have the beatific vision and they both love each other because of, of the God that dwells in them, etc., but they have a certain affinity because their tasks are related and they're, certain, they're in the same region or area or thing that they have to work on together. And some of them are under each other and so that's also. But it's the same thing here. And so God gives the, the you know, not just the hierarchy as a set of perfections, but even subgroups within the hierarchy will have specific perfections that they kind of share in common. It's the same thing here, even with families. The various lineages throughout history God is using to fashion specific things that he wants when heaven is finally and fully adorned, right? So the principal thing in heaven is when the demons fell, you got these gaps in hell, in heaven, sorry. And it had gaps in the order of grace, hierarchy of grace, and so God wants those refilled, but he also wants certain perfections to be manifest in there. There's only one person other than Christ that had all the perfections and all the plenitude, and that's Our Lady. Everyone else gets the little bits here and there, like us, okay. So this is one of the things that's important to realize is that God allows them into the generational line to gain a certain level of virtue and to accomplish certain things in relationship to it. 
He also sometimes allows it in order just to humiliate the demon, in order to crush him in that process. Why does he allow it in particular nations or even races? It's because that is a sign that that particular race or nation has a vocation to achieve the contrary. For example, what do you think is the generational spirit in the United States? No. No. Avarice and fraud. Avarice and fraud. From that, other things arise. By the way, I say that as having lived in Europe for several years and having been able to stand out and trying to see the United States through their eyes. This is what it is. If you even look at most of our wars and things like that, it's all done because it's there to protect our standard of living, our ability to make money. I mean, even the trade agreements are all about certain people making all sorts of money. Okay. It wasn't that way originally, but that's what it slowly became. Okay. Which is one of the upshots if you have an unmoderated, this is why John Paul II and a number of the popes have said, unmoderated capitalism leads to problems just like communism does, right? When it's unmoderated. When people say, oh no, I'm for a free market system. There is no such thing as a free market system. It doesn't exist. It cannot exist. Why? Because if you leave it completely free and don't put any regulations on it whatsoever, certain people will gain power and money and they will use their might to crush underfoot all competition. All you have to do is look at Rockefeller. Look at his life. Well, his whole life was about crushing the little man to keep his power and status. Okay. On the other hand, you can't overregulate it because then you thwart the perfections that can come from a society as a result of it. Okay. The point being in all this is, is that this is the one that's afflicting our country. What does that ultimately mean about our country? It meant that our country, God, look at what God gave our country. If you look at what's in our country, just the wealth of the minerals, the resources, the land, everything. If you look at all this, what he gave us, and what did we do? We squandered it. This is why he's pulling the plug on us right now, by the way. We're going down for count economically. There's nothing we can do about it because he's allowed evil people to get in charge, who, by the way, are driven by other people who have the avarice, but he's, he's letting us to become subject to this demon so we see what we become. What, what should have we done? Our country's real calling was to build the economic wealth and stability and economic welfare, not just of our country, but of all countries. It's part of the virtue of piety. And this is what we failed to do, to use our money for other people's welfare. That's what we failed to do. We, ironically, we were, we're not good liberals. See, <laughs> liberals in the United States today, the modern liberals think it's you use other people's money to help other people. No, you use your own money to help other people. Right? You don't tax people and take all their money so that you can help other people. That's not how it's done. It's you use your own money to help other people. And that's why he gave us, that's why he made us so economically powerful, so we could help everybody. Okay, but we didn't do it. Okay. So the point being is, is that there's a call, there's a specific call. And so what you need to do is, when you're assessing what is the generational spirit in my family, if you already know what it is, then what you do is you invert it. Because the demon is always going to invert what your family is being called to do. It's part of the, just the principle of diabolic inversion. I always like that because with demons, like, I'm not going to do this. Oh, so you're going to do this. Okay. And they'll just say, I, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, means you're going to tell me. You, know. you can't make me do this. No, but he can. Right? God, of course. So the point being is that you take what they say and you invert it, and that usually will tell you. So when you're looking at your own family lineage, you're going to take a look at that and realize this is what the calling of the family was. So for example... The family that had the spirit of pride that drove the intemperance, their call was to humility. That's what they were being called to. Ironically, when it got to the fifth generation, several members, the more spiritual members in that family, suffered tremendous humiliation from a variety of different sources. But they, they, they mastered it. They owned up to it. The family that had the generational spirit of fear 
some of them are now starting to combat it and develop the virtue of hope and confidence, which is the opposite of that, specifically confidence in God to provide and take care of you. You don't have to worry about it. So that's what you have to do is look at it. What's the inversion? What's the virtue opposite of that? That's one of the ways you're going to get them out, by the way. We'll talk more about that at that time. The generational spirits... Uh, there's a bit of misunderstanding about generational spirits, which we're going to talk a little bit about on how you get them out, especially in relationship to, because there's a lot of popular literature, not a lot, there's some popular literature out there that doesn't get it quite right. They're kind of taking the Mormon approach, which is the Mormons, you know why the Mormons do all the genealogy stuff? It's because they baptize all those people. Retroactively. So that's why for them, everybody's in heaven in the end. Because why? Because they're getting all these genealogies and they're baptizing all these people in the past. You can't baptize a dead man. Sorry. So the moral of the story is, is that in this, people are thinking, oh, well, then what we can do is, is that we can go back and we can do certain things in order to undo the generational spirit in the beginning. Sorry, he's already there. You can't change time. They get a gas out of watching some of these modern, um, or even just listening to modern scientists talk about time. Trust me, I've spent a significant amount of time thinking about time because I taught metaphysics. And time is a very distinctive thing. It's a quasi-law. It's a regulation of God of things through motion. It's a regulation on the side of God. And as a result of that, you'll hear them talking about, well, we could go back in time, or we could go forward in time. We could do this in time. You're not the cause. You're not the author. And you can't, the only way you can affect it is by speeding up a little bit and I just speed you up going through the continuum. But that's it. Okay, why am I getting into this? You can't go back and, and solve your problem that way. There's specific things you have to do to block this guy now. Okay. So, to, the, the, again, it's all these generational spirits you need to take a look at it. You can also take a We'll talk about this in the end. The generational spirit of the particular generation into which you were born. This is, uh, and they have a very distinctive spirit, but these last six were specifically chosen by Satan to bring about a specific kind of effect, which we are now seeing, but we'll talk about that when we get there. But the thing you have to realize is, okay, if I've got this generational spirit in my family, I've got to deal with it. You can't just put your head in the sand because why? He's there and he's going to drive it. The other thing is too, is just getting him out of your own life. By the way, they're not easy to get out. They're very difficult to get out. Because why? Through this authority structure, they've been there a little while. And you can conquer them in your own life, but then you have to watch everybody else in their lives. So usually I tell people, look, fight your own battle first. But sometimes it, it just telling people, you know, I think this is a generational spirit in the family and it's not genes or it's not this or it's not that, right? So like alcoholism that passes from generation to generation is genetic, they actually know the gene marker for it. And they can test for it just by a simple blood test. Whereas when you're talking about you know, spirit, uh, intemperance passing from generation to generation where it fluctuates and shifts around, that's, we're not talking about something genetic here. We're talking about something very, we're talking about something spiritual that's being passed. Sometimes it's a matter of kind of waiting between them. Generational spirits... <clears throat> are essentially of four kinds. The first is, is there's demons of um, possession. They get passed from generation to generation, as I mentioned in the case of the Satanists. What possesses in one generation does not necessarily possess in other generations. I have had two cases of possession, oh, sorry, three cases of possession from a generational lineage uh, issue and nobody prior to them was possessed except for the guy who started it. Everyone else didn't seem to be the case. So possession can be the result of it if you don't get this guy out of your line. Now, normally speaking, if it's a low-grade kind of a guy, you're not going to end up with possession. Okay. The next is demons of obsession, like fear, <clears throat> or anxiety, or things of this sort, depression sometimes. Then there's also demons of oppression. These are the ones where, you know, like I've actually, I'm, I'm working on a case of this right now where the family is suffering financially 
and it seems to have gone back a couple of generations, and it's also gone forward because the younger kids are having an extraordinarily different kind of time financially making it. Okay, so it can be the type of thing where the oppression follows a generation to generation. And then it can just be the spirits that just are past or that are there and just do ordinary temptation. Those are the four kinds that you'll end up seeing. These are obviously pretty rare. This one's, obsession is, I mean, possession is very rare. The obsession stuff, you're seeing more of it today. The oppression stuff you don't see too often in generational stuff, unless it's again connected to Freemasonry. A lot of times, for some reason or another, there's that oppression and connection to Freemasonry. Because the demons are moving people, they're attacking them from the outside, moving people from the outside to do these things. Most of us are just going to deal with the ordinary temptations of the things that are just kind of past. But this ordinary temptation is sufficient enough to actually fashion the psychology within a family. To where you see the whole family just starts taking on certain traits and certain behaviors. Some of it is just by implicit learning. The kid sees the parents and so they do it. But sometimes it's also just because the demon is there picking at the particular individual. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop. Now, tomorrow morning, we're going to pick up and we're going to start talking about uh, how you identify this guy in your line. There's some very distinctive things that you can do in order to figure out who is this guy that's afflicting my line. My experience is, is that uh, people say, oh, I know what ours is, it's this. Uh, 80 to 90% of the time, they're wrong. It's usually something else. And it's usually something, again, uh, that's not so predominant, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. So if you kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sanctum Supervos et Maniat Semper. Amen.